So what I'm going to be talking about today is brands and games. So, so this is less original IP, although I'm actually here in part because I have an original IP that's being showcased uh, in a couple of days. That it, it's in a very early state. But my company does a lot of work with brands, um, and in a in a cross platform kind of way uh, of taking a brand and extending it or taking a brand and developing it out. And what I want to talk today about is that reality. Now, I'm going to talk about games specifically, but I don't think this is isolated to games at all. I'm using games as my example because that's my background. But I imagine any kind of interactive technology could be used in a similar way because a lot of the realities of interactive technology are similar. Uh, in terms of the stuff that I've done, um, you know, it's like brand relationships with people like David Cronenberg. This is a project I did with Lance Weiler. I mentioned that because I believe it's a requirement if I'm speaking up here to mention Lance Weiler's name. Um, I'm not going to call him the son of this universe because I think that might grow his ego too much. So let's call him Jupiter that influences the meteors that go by. And I only say Jupiter in terms of the gravity that he exerts and not that Lance is a gas giant. Um, uh, the, so, so this was a project where, you know, Playmatics did game design on an experience that was designed to emulate um, like the early films of David Cronenberg and the kind of weird organic sci-fi world that he exists in. Um, this is work we did with the show Breaking Bad with AMC. AMC has been a wonderful client for interactive narrative work. Um, this was uh, based in like the second season of Breaking Bad around the character Hank, if you're familiar with the show. And this is some work we did with Red Bull around their marketing campaign uh, to build out the narrative of their sort of extreme sports athletes. And this was a game about a synesthetic experience of reforming photos according to music from their music academy. So it's like a broad set of, of, of ideas at work here. Um, when we think about games and brands, we're in kind of an interesting space because for a long time, games and brands were not taken very seriously. It was like you would have a game for your brand and you would put it out and it would supposedly draw some marketing attention to your product, but nobody really knew if it did anything and the games were generally crap. Um, and then they decided to do this with Kim Kardashian. So they came up with this game called Kim Kardashian Hollywood. And uh, Kim Kardashian Hollywood, you, you know, as it says here, you, you date and dump celebrities, you crash at best parties in the hottest clubs. It's actually kind of an old fashioned game in terms of social gameplay where you've got things like level and energy and you basically have a character that Kim Kardashian knows and you try to build yourself up as a, you know, sort of celebrity in the basically like Twitter fan universe. Um, there's a bit of an interactive narrative component where you make decisions about what you do and you navigate your way through a narrative where you date stars and you get bigger houses and stuff like that. Um, and of course, it's you know sort of based around this core idea of celebrity and it's tied to all the things that you know, we kind of know Kim Kardashian for. So it's, it's like really built around that brand. The reason why this is interesting is because it made a ton of money. Um, and this was a little bit shocking to everybody in the games industry because we didn't realize that Kim Kardashian could make a ton of money. And part of it's the bias that Joe was talking about that we don't take <laughs> casual games that seriously. As someone who's worked in casual games my whole life, I find it ridiculous because we've been a billion dollar industry for the last 10 years. But um, I, I also think it's interesting that a branded game made this kind of money because they generally don't. Or if they do, they make it because the brand sucks in a bunch of sci-fi people who will buy anything. Um, and there haven't been many cases of games that outside of the sci-fi brands that have made any money at all, and certainly not one that made money with this kind of force. But I think part of that is the fact that, it, that this is a really well-made game about Kim Kardashian. I mean, if you are actually interested in Kim Kardashian as a brand, like you are interested in these things, like which stars you're dating, and how big your house is, and how many Twitter followers you have. And making a game about that is an effective way to reach those people. So I, I think that that's, like, that's what we want to do when we, make, when we make properties for brands, is express the brand. And so, I want to think a little bit about how games explore brands before I get into what I really want to talk about, which is not just how games explore brands, but how games can be used with brands. Um, so this is a game that we did for The Walking Dead. Um, it's called Dead Reckoning. We got uh, top rating in the Android App Store for about eight weeks with this, um, which, was, which was exciting. Uh, we didn't charge for it because AMC didn't want to. I'll talk more about that later on. Um, the idea behind the game was that it's part of the narrative of Walking Dead. It's like it actually takes place pri prior, prior to the show. Um, this is based on the show, by the way, not the comic. Those are different rights. That's a much longer story that I don't have time to tell you. But um, the idea is we want to explore the backstory of one of the characters, Shane, uh, and explore how the zombie apocalypse started. Um, and that, that was like an interesting challenge, right? Like to actually tell the story of how a zombie apocalypse starts because if you think about it from a gameplay perspective, zombie stories are kind of hard to do accurately and particularly the origin stories of zombie stories is hard to do because everybody knows what a zombie story is about. It's about shooting people in the head. So if you put somebody in something that you call a zombie story, they immediately get into a mindset that's going to be about, I'm going to shoot everything in the head that seems even remotely suspicious. Um, <laughs> But that's not the experience of being in a zombie apocalypse. The experience of being in a zombie apocalypse is not knowing what's going on. The experience of being in a zombie apocalypse is not realizing that your loved ones have actually turned into monsters. And that's actually probably the most interesting moment of the zombie apocalypse is the moment where someone that you used to love um, actually is becoming a monster. And you have to make a decision about 
the, their irredeemability of that. Like, can you cross this line where you realize that they are no longer the person you knew? That's a challenging and difficult thing to do, and we wanted to make gameplay that expressed that, and that's what we did in this game. Now, we did this because The Walking Dead is a television show, and it goes off season. And when it's off season, there's kind of nothing for you to do as a Walking Dead fan. And so AMC was interested in extending the narrative through that off season. And so we built the game so that it would release off track with the television station, so that if you were interested in continuing the narrative of Walking Dead, you could by playing this game. But is that really the only use that we can see interactive technology for? Is that like the only way we can understand how this interactive technology can in, in associate with brands? And I want to argue that it's not. And I actually think in the ways that, that Walking Dead works is actually one of the least interesting ways we can use interactive technology. And this is, this is riffing off of, I think, what every speaker has said up to this point. So I want to give you a completely different example. And this one comes from Disney. Sorry for the pixelation. I think it's kind of ironic that the one slide I have in my deck that's pixelated is Disney's. Um, so Disney is a monstrously huge organization with lots of very, very smart parts. Um, and one of those parts is called Creature Feet. They're a company based out of Chicago. This is about as much web presence as they have, so I decided companies that just make little things for them. And they, they actually support a lot of independent production internally. So they actually had people experimenting. And, one of, and Creature Feet had an experiment with a game about physics, which effectively allowed you to, to shoot water around and then they used the interactivity of the touchscreen of the iPad to dig out channels of dirt that would move the water around. You may know this game. It's called Where's My Water? Um, and, and Creature Feet made this mechanic. They kind of invented this mechanic as they were playing around with what would be interesting with touch controls. But what they realized is as a company that worked for Disney, that Disney's a very character-driven company. And actually, the people at Creature Feet were interested in narrative. So they wanted to build a character. And they, they saw this as an opportunity. Hey, we have this new mechanic. Let's make a character for it and see if we can push it that way because that's the company we're at and we want to make narrative. And so they came up with this idea of, a, of an alligator, like a swamp alligator. They were sort of thinking about the urban legend of like alligators living in the sewers. Um, but an alligator living in the sewers who hates dirt and wants to always be clean. That's their trick. His name is Swampy. That's Swampy right there. This is an early sketch from the company of, of how Swampy worked. And so they, they put a lot of attention into building out the character and that became this game, Where's My Water? Whereas My Water is notable because it was the first game that dethroned Angry Birds from the top spot of the, of the App Store. Um, it made a lot of money because you, you, could, you charged for it. It was a free-to-play game where you could play the first few levels for free and then you bought additional levels. It's an interesting free-to-play game because it's based on an old shareware model, which was the classic in the casual game space, but it did very, very well. And there's like dozens of level packs for it now, and there's alternate versions for other Disney properties, et cetera, et cetera. But again, that's actually not really what's interesting to me about Where's My Water. Where's My Water is a very successful game that Disney made. That's not shocking. Um, but what is interesting to me is that Swampy as a character infiltrated the Disney universe. So if you go into stores, you can buy little Swampy toys. And if you go on Disney cruises, you can walk around with the Swampy character. Um, and what's most interesting to me is, in fact, you can now watch animated adventures of Swampy on YouTube. So this thing that started as a game experience uh, worked its way over to the core business of what Disney is, which is producing animations and producing the, the, the licensed properties around animation. And I think what's fascinating about, is, about that is, is that relationship, is that this really just started as a, as a mobile game. And the company that made it was simply a mobile games company. But what it turned into was a brand that Disney could exploit. Um, and the way that this actually worked in this case was that the game mechanic was came up with first, and then they moved into the character. But there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't imagine it working the opposite way. Why couldn't we come up with a character and just make a game mechanic for it? And I think what's most interesting about that is that you know when we ask ourselves, this is in relation to what Liz was talking about at the top of the this, at the top of the the conference, is that you know the cost of making a new animation and releasing it into the market is is in, is insane, like the amount of time and cost that that has. But this game. You could make this game for like a low six-figure budget, and it would be really a good amount of money for that game. Like, a, it's a solid, solid game. Compared to the cost of an animation, that's nothing. Um, and if you go through the kind of beta release process that Joe was talking about, you could do it even cheaper. So something that could get us to a brand that could actually be an animated series could be done this cheaply. That's a really interesting process. And I think about that as brand invention, right? Games don't have to exist as a, as a component of brand extension. They could actually create brands. Uh, I think about this as you know a life cycle, right? That like if we imagine that there's like a there's an invention and a development and an extension of any brand, we could see games as existing in any part of this. And again, read games as interactive media. You know, we could think about games as early experiments to test concepts cheaply. 
We can think about games as steps in the story that are equal parts to the other narrative. Um, you know, or we could think about games as an external element that expand the fan base and bridge series gaps. I'm going to go in opposite order. Um, because that's actually the history of games as they've developed in brands. You know, when we think about games as brand extension, they serve an interesting com marketing or commercial purpose, right? You can, you can take it through marketing, in which case the game is just designed to advance the IP. It's critical that it, that it gets adopted and not monetized, and your development costs here are really related to platform and reach, just like how many people do you want to reach and where are you putting the things out. That's like where Red Bull existed. Red Bull has no interest in making money off its games. Red Bull makes money off of selling sports drinks. Um, but they make money off of selling, selling sports drinks by having people parachute out of near space and like drive race cars because they associate like like they can't they can't prove this so they don't talk about it how it makes you more focused or anything but they want to create that association among their brand and so anything that establishes that is good for Red Bull and so Red Bull funds things like this just as ways to extend the brand um, but you can also do this commercially and in this case you're really trying to exploit the brand to monetize it. Um, that's more expensive and more involved because you're competing in the marketplace now. If the game is free and it's just appealing to Red Bull fans and people vaguely interested in Red Bull, you don't have to worry so much about like competing against Angry Birds, but if you're going to charge money for it, you do because that spending dollar could have gone to Angry Birds. Um, it's not an automatic success by any stretch of the imagination to use a brand in this space. As I mentioned, games and brands were seen as toxic for a very long time, but a good game tied to an appropriate category can be very successful. I have to say it again because it's so crazy how successful this game was. Um, but th this is your model, right? A well-designed game around a big brand can explode if it's marketed the right way. But we see this with other games, too, on, in the uh, App Store. This is a simple version of a Hunger Games app. There were lots of games that came out about Hunger Games, and Hunger Games was sort of a threshold, I think, for this stuff because the games were actually of much higher quality. A Temple Run-style runner in, in Hunger Games is not ridiculous because there are lots of times uh, when she's running. Katniss runs a lot. Uh, so it's not ridiculous to move into that as a mechanic. And so the natural relationship of those things, I think, is something that's really good. Um, we can also look at games as a, a, a positioning them as brand development, right? There's a question of like how games can be a part of the narrative universe itself. In this case, playing the game is actually part of the story. The story is transmedial. So like when you play the game, you're supposed to be engaged with the story as you go. So the game is not a marketing device because you actually don't know the whole story unless you play the game. The game is a consumable of the narrative the way everything else is. And I, again, you know, like there's no reason not to monetize on that. It's like crazy not to ask a dedicated fan base not to pay money for something that's part of a brand that they love if they already love the brand and pay money for other parts of it. Um, again, you know, like, like the, the sort of Disney, not at the time, this was not made when Disney owned LucasArts, but Disney has been very much in the part of this. Star Wars is one of the great brands for exploring this. They've done lots of work in terms of building out the universe. Um, Force Unleashed is a really interesting example where it's tied directly into the movie space. Of course, this has been done previously. Um, the Matrix, uh, like there's a famous moment in the second Matrix movie where a team of people is going off to an office building to like find their way into like the, the main brain of the, of the Matrix and another team is in the, the weird uh, like real world floating around in their ship and they have to deactivate something and this third team goes off to deal with a power plant. And if you watch the second Matrix movie, you see a long story about the people in the real world and a long story about the office building. And the power plant story is, hey, you two are going to the power plant. And the next time you see them, the power plant blows up. That was on purpose because all of that content is in this game. So if you want to find out what happens to Niobe and Ghost as they go to destroy the power plant, you have to play this game. And that was designed that way from the beginning. A similar thing was done with Chronicles of Riddick. Um, where the, the arc of Chronicles of Riddick was built into the gameplay. So to totally understand the story, you had to play the game. These were moderately successful examples, but they were also quite early. And I would argue that these are quite expensive. You can do this much cheaper, right? So this is the game we did for um, AMC, uh, for the second game we did for Breaking Bad called The Cost of Doing Business, which is a, a Jesse Pinkman story. Um, we worked with uh, the producers of uh, Breaking Bad and the writers of Breaking Bad on this. So this work is canon. And if you look at the interactive like archiving of Breaking Bad. This is part of that interactive archive, but this game did not cost anywhere near tens of millions of dollars to make. Um, so we can do this actually quite cheaply, and this was, these were well-consumed properties. We got hundreds of thousands of views on this thing. Um, and then finally, we could think about brand invention, right? Like, so the game could be a way to incubate a new brand. Again, what I want to stress here is that the thing that people don't think about these technologies often is that they're actually quite cheap <laughs> compared to other things you could do to incubate a brand, and you could do them quite quickly. So again, as Liz mentioned at the beginning of the conference, like getting within a year to something that you could show to an audience is something really interesting. And the most fascinating thing about this is that if you look at the genre fiction, 
that, that is often a major driver of fan support. You look at things like horror, sci-fi, fantasy, detective, thriller, soap operas, historic melodramas, these like specific like brand, like, like, like kind of genre brands. These are all, if, in the demographics of these brands, people who play games. Uh, some of them are hardcore game players. That's the stuff that goes up to about detective. But when you look at thriller and soap opera and, and historic melodrama, these are casual game players. And in fact, casual game players went a very long time on ideas of thrillers and soap operas. If you know the genre of hidden object games, which was dominant in casual games around 2006, like those games were all games about like thriller, murder she wrote kind of mysteries, and games about historical reenactment. So in all of these cases, we see that there are game models that these people have played extensively and that they enjoy playing and they will look at, they will search for on their own. So there's a natural relationship of treating those as proper, as ways to float properties for people. And I think this is a really interesting thing to think about there about if you're making a sci-fi property of any kind and you could make a cheap game that would explore that sci-fi property for your audience, you have an automatic test group of your audience of game players because the diagram of the user of a game of that sort and the user of a show of that sort is exactly the same. So if I, if I find that the game is successful, it's probably in part because the narrative brand is successful and that's something I could exploit. And how much does it cost to make a game relative to a pilot? There aren't a lot of examples of this right now. Um, and there are not a lot of examples of strategies of like sort of brand invention that flow out this way. But I think there are a couple of interesting cases. I already talked about one of them, which is Where's My Water? Disney had no intent of doing this. So I think that this was like as a first attempt to do this, it was a little bit, it wasn't as elegant as they, they probably would do in the future. But I would expect Disney to do more of this going forward. And if you're interested in the state of transmedia from, from the big boys doing something huge, watch Disney around Star Wars. Because Disney has effectively fired almost every game developer that worked for them and rebuilt the whole studio around the idea that a new movie is coming. And that change is going to be a dramatic change to the way we see Star Wars movies released because nobody at Disney is unaware that a build up towards the new movie is going to be critical to the movie making sense. So just keep your eye on that space because I think the, the way that transmedia works around Star Wars is going to be one of the most interesting transmedial experiments we see on the large scale in the near future. Um, there have been a lot of examples of this with, with toy game hybrids. Um, this is a game called Skylanders, which started off as a bunch of little toys that you would buy that you would interface with a very simple game. This is one of the top 20 grossing games of all time. Uh, so it's, it's an enormous property. So enormous that Disney is ripping it off and Nintendo is ripping it off. Um, so, so, but this started really as like making tiny little toys in a simple little game. And that relationship, I think, is a really interesting thing where, again, starting with something very simple and moving up, we have yet to see Skylanders television content or YouTube content or a development of Skylanders into a bigger narrative universe, but I would be shocked if that didn't happen. Um, so we can think about that ecosystem moving out. And I don't have a slide for this, but since, the, since Lance already showed it, I'll just mention it. And then, of course, there's Minecraft. If you don't know the story of Minecraft, Minecraft was basically made by a couple people. Um, uh, the main one is a, a guy who goes by the name of Notch, uh, the alias of Notch. But what's interesting about Minecraft is that Minecraft didn't release in any meaningful way relative to how the game industry worked. Um, originally, Minecraft was just a 3D tool that let you build things. It was sort of like Legos with 3D. And when Notch started to build Minecraft, the very first thing he did was he went to these 3D modeling sites, because you can find them, sites where people just do 3D models and explore different modeling software. And he released it to them for free. And he said, hey, here's Minecraft. You can have this for free forever. But please play it and tell me what you think, and I'll make it better for you. And because it was free and they knew they'd get it free forever, they said, okay, and they played around with it and they gave him suggestions and he went back and he rebuilt it. And then he released it again to those communities and he went back and he rebuilt it. And then eventually he got to something that he considered a beta and he released it on the internet. He didn't do much marketing around it, he just sort of threw it up and he charged five bucks for it. This is when I found Minecraft. This was probably like three years ago. Um, and basically said, hey, you can have this for five dollars and you'll have it for, for free forever after that, but play it and tell me what you think. At this time, no one had heard of Minecraft. Minecraft was like this weird game industry object that people heard about that was sort of like Legos where you'd play and you'd fight little monsters. And so we went in and we played it and the whole games industry got obsessed with it for a little while and nobody introduced it to any kids and no kids were really playing it. So what I'm talking about, this strategy, was like about like two years before Minecraft became the thing it is today. So when we wonder why Minecraft is the way, the thing it is today, like how it became the thing it is today, it became that way because it built its brand from the very beginning in a really early, simple way. It did cheap steps to build its way up to something bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, Minecraft is one example, and there are millions of people <laughs> trying to do this. 
And so I'm not saying that every attempt to do this is successful. But I want to point out again that it's like these cheap steps that explore audiences and build relationships with audiences that actually help us build brands in a more effective way. And they've led to really great success. So I guess what I want to offer is thinking about games and interactive media as part of a brand's life cycle. This isn't just true if you're building an IP from scratch. This isn't just true if you're thinking about a transmedial ecosystem around nonfiction. This isn't even just true if you're dealing with something small. Like anything that I think exists in this landscape could be imagined through a landscape of invention, development, and extension. And that interactive technology can exist in any point in that spectrum. Really what we're trying to do is figure out how we can use things to their best needs. And if, we really, if what we really want to do is test something, right? Like just put something out into an audience and see it, probably we want to do that the cheapest way we can. Right? We want to do that the fastest, cheapest way we can that we know our audience is going to be available for. And for at least genre fiction, right? at least the kind of core genre fictions that we see um, in, in like things like sci-fi and fantasy and the casual game next eye of things like soap opera and historical reenactment, we know that those audiences exist in other places and that we can make things cheaper for them there. So what I would argue is that as we move forward with brand strategy, we need to think about transmedia not as an exercise in marketing strategy and not as an exercise in extension of a main property, but instead a kind of growing experiment around story worlds that can test things early and fast and cheap and then develop up to more expensive and more profoundly deep forms moving forward. But these early stages, games are a way to do it very, very cheap. And I think that's a place where games could occupy uh, brand transmedial properties where they currently don't in a very effective way. Thank you.